Welcome to Create. Yeah, I, I think you can do better. One more time. Welcome to Create. Right. Woo. Hey, we've had an amazing week. Um, we have had 13 men and women here from, like we had somebody from Germany, from Canada, all over America. Can I get you guys to stand up? So just give them a clap. We've had an amazing week, uh, songwriting, vocal training, you name it, for creating uh, with God. We went wa whale watching. Uh, our, my, my heart was to fall in love with God through creation, through the word of God, singing it, playing it, drawing it, writing it, just like David did for the Psalms. Yeah, and, you know, we believe God wants to move here on the Central Coast. Who believes that? <coughs> we believe it so much that we moved from Scotland to come here because we believe God's going to move. And one of the things that I think he's going to really move through is worship and creativity. Can you imagine, like, notes and melodies that, like, see legs grow back and signs and wonders breaking out? So... We really, we really wanted to invest and, and create this space where we can grow deeper into the presence of God. Are you up for it? Yeah. Yes. So we just want to start by giving you permission. So we want to give you permission. The Psalms has so many expressions. Psalms. The Psalms. <laughs> the Psalms. The Psalms. Has so many expressions <laughs> of worship. So the Psalms <laughs> talk about uh, <laughs> dancing, it talks about lifting up a shout, about bowing down, standing in awe, and about singing new song songs unto the Lord. So we want to start and just say you have permission to express your worship, you have permission to be free in worship, and so we want to invite you if you want to express yourself, get out of your chairs, come and use the front and dance before the Lord, bow down before the Lord, lift up a shout, but we would ask that you show some love and respect to our artists, so just give them a wide berth, but yeah, you're free, and who the sun sets free is free indeed, and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he comes upon you with boldness, so our challenge is, if you're used to getting into worship, and you're at ankle deep, I challenge you tonight, that move out to your knees, and if knee deep to the ankle deep, because there's no place like the presence of God, let's get fully immersed in the river of God tonight, and just enjoy being with Jesus. And what I'm really excited about is we have asked some of our local pastors to uh, come and open the service and pray. Uh, and local worship teams are our worship. Tonight we have the amazing Jessica Webster from Equippers Church. Um, and uh, uh, Pastor John Sparrow is going to... He's awesome. He's going to be in the back, some of his team. If you do not have a church, a local church, you can go visit um, and just ask questions. We, our heart is to get people plugged into a local church. But right now, before anything else, we're going to invite the directors of the Apostolic Center here, Rick and Lori Taylor, to give you a greeting, and we're going to start our worship. Well, welcome, everyone. You never know what God's going to do around here, so I hope you came expecting something big. You know, when we have expectation, the heavens open, and anything can happen. And this place is known for miracles. And we're seeing so many miracles happening just in the glory realm and, and during worship. So uh, I just want to release that right now. Uh, you know, I don't know if you, what you were expecting when you came here, but we can't help if you get healed. It just, it just happens automatically. But we want to welcome everybody from the different churches and the different pastors. Good to have you all here. Yeah, and it's so exciting to see this happening. Um, Julie's been here for a handful of years now. And um, before she came, Cindy Goff, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, but she's the worship pastor director here. And she's had in her heart for years to have a worship school. And we're all just feeling, and Ellen and Naomi being here, feeling like, Possibly this is the beginning, the kickoff of a worship school. So it's just so exciting to see what God's doing. So welcome, everyone. And um, wanna... yeah, And at this time, we just want to invite 
Pastor John Sparrow from Equipper Church to come up and open in prayer. Thank you, Rick and Lori. Guys, can you stand? We're going to get into worship. My name is John Sparrow. I'm the lead pastor at Equipper's Church in Arroyo Grande. Um, and it's so good to be here. we got Jessica, our worship pastor, is going to lead us. Um, in my opinion, she's the best. Not that there's any competition or anything. Um, but I just want to encourage you tonight. Um, we think about the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Can, there's, there's one excuse, though, when it comes to worship, that we get to ditch one of the fruits of the Spirit. I don't know if you're aware of this. You get to forget about patience when it comes to God's presence. Because you don't have to wait for anything. You don't have to wait till you feel a certain way. You don't have to wait until you hear a song that you like. You don't have to wait for anything. In Hebrews, it says that we approach His throne of grace with boldness. And so forget about patience for a moment, would you? Is that okay? We forget about patience and enter into God's presence with boldness and full assurance that at His throne of grace, we, we find grace. We find everything we need. And uh, again, the, the front's open. Whatever it looks like for you to be bold tonight, I encourage you to be bold. For some of you coming into this room, is the most bold thing you've done in a while. So good on you for your boldness. But come on, maybe there's a, there, there, there's a shout in you tonight. Maybe there's something of surrender in you tonight. But can we just make a commitment to be bold as we approach His throne? Amen? Awesome. Let's pray. And we'll get into it. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence that's here even now. And God, we, we take you at your word that you inhabit the praises of your people and we are expectant for an encounter with the Holy One. And God, I ask that you would remind us of your goodness, of your faithfulness, your mercy. And I, I again, I release the glory of God, the glory of God that brings wholeness, that brings healing. And Lord, for anybody in this room who, who feels that they are detached, that, that they've been far away, that there is something God, I ask that you would give them an anointing to throw off everything that would hinder them from approaching you with confidence. And we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter. God, we ask that you receive all the glory, all the power. Come on, before the music starts, would you lift your voice? Jesus, we exalt you. We lift you. And we, we set you on your rightful place, on your throne. In this place tonight, God, we ask you to receive every ounce of glory and honor. We choose to sing a new song. We tune our ears, we tune our attention to the sound of heaven tonight. We say, let it be a sweet sound in this space tonight. You're so worthy. You're so worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Can you just actually begin to lift your voice right now? Can we just exalt the Lord together? Come on, don't be afraid. Now's the time to pray.
God says there's a seed right underneath there and the rain is coming down tonight. Come on, and there's breakthrough. It's breaking through the ground. And your praises, your praises are bringing down the rain. So if all you can do is just look with your eyes, I don't care if you're like this, I don't care if you're jumping around. If you just want to say, God, I'm going to have some faith and I'm going to make turn my eyes and put my eyeballs up to you, Lord God. I'm going to see you. I'm going to see you. I'm not going to see the dry, dead ground anymore. I'm going to believe that there's seed under there that you're watering because you're the God of breakthrough. And I hear this. You guys can sing this with me. Worship on, I mean, really get it on. <laughs> I just want to speak right now to the fear of man that has even gripped my life right now. I just declare that we are going to praise God in the presence of men and angels with no fear, whatever it looks like. Sometimes there's a prophetic act, and I know that I get in my own head, but I'm seeing right now that I have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, and we are breaking the fear of man off in this place right now. Come on. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. And I'll raise a hallelujah. Oh, my weapon is a melody. That's also my wife's name. <laughs> I'll raise a hallelujah. <laughs> Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna see the middle of the storm.
you're about to move, feel it in the wind you're about to ride in, you said that you would pour your spirit out, you said that you would fall on sons and daughters, so come. Invite him right now in your own words.
basking in his beauty. There's nothing like his presence. Sing just the voices. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Show 
now just worship Jesus in his presence. Oh, we drink you in, we drink in your love, Jesus, your holy day. You guide us with
know you got a plan. I obey. I'm okay. That you got a plan for me. I was straight. No delay. You are coming back. I know that you got me in your hands. I was sick and faith. Father, you're the king. I understand. But you're coming back for me. And you got a plan. I know you do. You're the king of kings, Lord God. I can see that you're always coming through. Get away, Lord God. I need you. Lord, I just want to pursue you until I'm through. Because you're beautiful. Yeah, you are. Take a deep, Lord. Take a deep.
Father, we thank you for your presence. We love you so much, Jesus. We pray that you would open our eyes afresh tonight in wonder. Open our eyes in wonder. Show us another aspect of who you are. Another part of your character. Another part of your love, Lord. There's always more of you to find out, to seek like treasure and so we seek you tonight we seek you out a fresh aspect of who you are we so love you and we love your presence thank you there's joy in your presence there's peace So good, doesn't it? Woo! Ah. Let's hear it for the band. Woo! And Jessica from Equippers Church. Woo! And our guest rappers. Wasn't that cool, eh? Woo! Awesome. I love that line in that song. It says, open our eyes and wonder. You know, I often think about the, the, you can take your seats if you want. I often think about um, in Revelation where it says that the, the elders like see and then they, they fall down and lay their crowns. I often think that when you see a, a part of who God is, Revelation, you just can't help but be in wonder and fall down and and then you get back up and he shows you another aspect of who he is and you can't help but fall down you know he does so much more to who he is so it's such a joy to be in his presence and just see more of who god is it's amazing you understand the accent yes, yes. <laughs> all right this is my lovely wife naomi Yeah, so I get the job of just encouraging you to worship through your giving. So we put this on for free because, you know, there was changes last minute. But, you know, we just want to uh, sow into the Central Coast worship. We want to uh, just invest and worship in this area. And so we're asking you tonight if you would, if you would just ask the Lord what you should give. Because we plan to do more throughout the year we plan to do this again next year we plan to like meet together write together worship together seek the face of God together and we really believe that the next move of God the hallmark is going to be glory filled 
presence worship that's going to wreck us and going to overflow out of us and reach the broken of of Santa Maria and the whole valley. And so we want to invest in the worshipers, not just to sing the good songs and to have the skill, but to have the heart that carries the fire and the presence that when they open their mouth, they release the glory of God. And that's our heart for Create. We, We believe that every person has a unique sound, has a unique voice, and with they get, tap into the voice that God's given them, not trying to copy another movement, but just knowing who they are in Christ, that great things are going to break out here. So we're just asking the ushers will go about and just put the basket round, and we just want to encourage you to give. And uh, we just thank you in advance for all that you want to sow in. We also have forms for something that I don't know, but <laughs> it's for something. <laughs> Or if you're paying by credit or debit cards, just put your hand up and somebody will give you a a form to fill in. And I think we'll get announcements. And yeah, while we're waiting, we're going to show um, some video announcements of other events that happen here in the Healing Rooms Apostolic Centre. So feast your eyes on the screens. Rachel, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Good, what can I do for you? So over the past couple years, I've had this really bad sinus issue, and I was speaking to my mother about it, and come to find out she has the same problem, and her mother has the same problem. Wow, it sounds like a generational curse coming down through the family line. The good news is that God can do something about that. Uh, Very shortly, I'm going to be teaching a seminar about breaking curses and generational curses and releasing God's blessings over people's lives, I think that would be good for you. Would you be interested in coming along? Of course. Okay, well, we'll see you then. Do you have passion for the Word? Would you like to increase your passion? Come be with us at the Santa Maria Healing Rooms, August 15th to 17th for Passion for the Word Conference. We're having Dr. Brian and Candace Simmons, authors of the Passion Translation Bible, come and teach you how to study the Bible. There will be Julie Meyer who will teach you how to sing the Bible, and yours truly, Wesley and Stacy Campbell, will teach you how to pray the Bible. Lock that out in your calendar. Come be with us. Take a little extra time for holidays. It's beautiful here in Santa Maria. See you then. What's up guys? My name is Cody. I'm a youth leader here in Santa Maria and I'd love to invite you guys to our next One Voice event. We're inviting all the youth groups here on the Central Coast. At this event, we're going to be talking about worship. If you're feeling dry, disconnected, or distracted, we're going to talk about the core meaning behind it and we're going to reignite our passion for God. It's also just going to be a great night. We're going to have food, games, merch. So come on out, bring a friend, August 21st, 6 p.m. We'll see you guys there. Yay. So, um, uh, you know, part of our heart for Create was we wanted to um, invite friends along that could come and just share their heart and share their uh, journey and message of worship that could help us take us deeper in that as well. And uh, one of the people we originally invited was Ray Hughes. And unfortunately, Ray fell ill. Um, He had an accident a couple of years ago, and he struggles with vertigo. But then he came down with shingles as well. And so he was in hospital, and uh, he couldn't make it. So um, one of the other people we're hoping to get maybe next year was Jason Upton. Um, And uh, uh, Jason and I have known each other for a few years now, but we've got a mutual friend, uh, Al Sergo. And I called up Al to say, hey, do you think think Jason would make it? And he was like, I think he might. So he got in touch and Jason was like, I'll do it, I'll come. So we're so honored to have Jason with us tonight. He's going to come and just share and be himself and share what's on his heart. And uh, yeah, we're so honored, Jason. Up you come, let's hear it for Jason. Uh, 
expecting a lot. <laughs> yes. Oh. Woo. I felt like I drove forever from LA to get here. <laughs> so much traffic. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Can you even stop singing? <laughs> Lower me down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I was messing around this week. Let's see if this works. Yeah, maybe not. Wait, let's see. Is this on? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, can, you, uh, can you just give me a stand for this mic? visit me last week and uh, I'm a terrible guitar player so don't turn that up too loud. Uh, Let's see. He did. Oh, he's going to grab. Okay, here, I'll just put it like this. Okay. <laughs> you can go like that, right? That's pretty sweet, man. <laughs> Come on now. So anyway, this week I've been working on this with my daughter and uh, Nate and I. And it just says, if I was a rich man, if I was the rich man, right, would I hold on to it? Can you give me a, a stand for this? It'll be better. <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. You want to just hold it for me? Or do you want me just to rap? Oh, yeah, that'll work. That'll work. Yeah. <laughs> If I was a rich man, if I was thinking about this, if I was, I was thinking about, about the idea of sometimes breakthrough in the Bible coming by going lower. And uh, anyway, this is about as low. I'll be having, maybe I'll sit down here. Is it? Does that work, that thing right there? Oh, I see. I see what you're doing. Sorry about that, man. You're the best. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. You might need to move over here. Oh, yeah. Sure, I'll do it. I'll do it. All right, here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's awesome. So, all right. So it just says, uh, if I was a rich man, if I was the rich man, would I hold on to it? Or hold back nothing? And let you change my world Money, power, and position When it comes down to it Ain't worth a thing If I can't have you So lower me down Oh, Jesus Sing that with me Lower I want to be with you. Lower me down. Oh, Jesus. Lower me down. I want to be with you. Sing one more time. Lower me down. Oh, Jesus. Lower Mm-hmm. 
I started thinking about it and I was like, if I would it if I were Zacchaeus, if I were Zacchaeus, I found this out the other day. Think about this. If I were Zacchaeus, which means pure and innocent. Did you know that his name meant pure and innocent? Gosh, man. It just changed the whole story for me. Jesus just walks into all that judgment and is like, hey, purity and innocence. If I were Zacchaeus, which means pure and innocent. If I was the climber in the sycamore tree. You could call me a traitor. You could call me anything. But Jesus is calling, and he's calling to me. So lower me down, come on. Oh, Jesus, lower me down. this one how about this one um, I just got this yesterday too when you reach for the sky and you cannot get to it when you tried and you tried and don't know what to do when you feel paralyzed and just can't get moving cause the weight of the world got its hold on you these are troubling times and people are hurting we are crowded with lies and counterfeit truth but the faithful will rise to carry the burden and we will rip off this rooftop get to you so lower me down come on everyone oh Jesus lower me down I want to be with you lower me down lower me down oh Jesus lower Well, the deaf and the blind 
and the poor in spirit. We're all desperately trying to get to you. Isn't that true? <laughs> I don't even know how deaf I am half the time. Oh, the deaf and the blind and the poor in spirit. We're all desperately trying to get to you. So Jesus, lower me down. Oh, Jesus, lower me down. I want to be with you. So go on and lower me down. Oh, Jesus, lower me down. I want to be with you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So open your Bibles to Matthew 14. And uh, tomorrow morning I'll come early, hop on the piano, and we'll get a proper sound check. I'll sing over you guys a little bit. But it is kind of fun for me to, I'm, I'm, I'm a te- it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. But I do that with my kids all the time. And my daughter was like, you should just do that, Dad. It's so cheap and there's something about it it's fun I like it vulnerable or something listen to this um, I read this the other, the other week Wendell Berry talks about going uh, on his father's farm and walking on his father's farm one day in Kentucky and he says for many years My walks have taken me down an old fence row in a wooded hollow on what was once my grandfather's farm. A battered, galvanized, there's this battered, galvanized bucket that's hanging on a fence post near the head of the hollow. And I never go by it without stopping to look inside. For what is going on in that bucket is the most momentous thing I know. The greatest miracle that I've ever heard of. It's making earth. The old bucket is hung there through many autumns and the leaves have fallen around it and some have fallen into it or been carried into it by squirrels. And mice and squirrels have eaten the meat of the nuts and left the shells. And they and the other animals have also left their droppings. I love that. (laughs) Or perhaps a feather or two. And this slow work of growth and death, gravity and decay, which is the chief work of the world has by now produced in the bottom of the bucket several inches of black humus. And I look into that bucket with fascination because I am a farmer of sorts and I am an artist of sorts. And I recognize there an artistry and a farming far superior to mine or to that of any human. I've seen the same process at work immorally over most of the land surface of the world. All creatures die into it and they live by it. I want to walk by that rusty old bucket and make sure I don't walk by it. I want to look inside it because the most miraculous thing I've ever seen, he says, is inside that bucket. The power of resurrections inside that bucket. All things are being made new inside that bucket. Right? I thought, wow. Lower me down to be where you are, Jesus. Lower Yo guys, me down what's up? It's Rick Pino to be here. where I'm you so are, pumped. Jesus. There's no higher way than the way of Jesus. So lower me down, Jesus, to be where you are. In the midst of that little rusty, I love stuff like that because it makes me aware we're creative. I love Eugene Peterson actually says this. He says, 
It's impossible to be a follower of Jesus and not at some level be creative. It just takes too much imagination. So Matthew 14, let's start here. The feeding of the 5,000. Now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there, you know, his, his death. He withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when he went ashore... He saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this place is a desolate place and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, well, we've only got five loaves and two fish. And he said, we'll bring them here to me. And ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and breaking the loaves. He gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. There were about 5,000 men who ate besides women and children. Gosh, 5,000. Some people say there was upwards of 40,000 people there. We, we have this account in all four Gospels, and they all have a bit of a different beautiful twist. Like the, the Gospel of John, it's the little boy's lunch, right? Right? Jesus heard about John, and he goes out into a desert place, a deserted place, a secluded place. I love that. Jesus isn't running around looking for the promised land. Jesus goes to deserted places, and they turn into promised lands. This is powerful. Jesus goes into a secluded place and people literally follow him out of the villages in the cities. Why is that powerful? That's powerful because as far back as Genesis, we see that there's this anxiety of scarcity that's set in. Jesus comes to take us from a God of, or to an anxiety of scarcity into a a father of abundance, right? It's so strong, you know, Abraham, as full of faith as Abraham was, when the famine came, we still see in Genesis 12 that he finds his way to the bread basket of Egypt where the bread was, where Pharaoh had stored up the bread. He still found his way to that bread basket of Egypt where all the bread was as full of faith as he was and yet it's interesting you know the empire continually tries to tell us it can feed us and Jesus wants to lead us not to this anxiety of scarcity why is that why is that why do I say that because because Pharaoh had all the bread and yet ironically he's still having nightmares of scarcity so the, the systems of empire continually want to lie to us and say, especially those of us that are creative, that if we, if we have just a little bit more, you won't have that anxiety. And Jesus says, no, the only thing that will eradicate the anxiety is to be introduced to a father who knows you by your name and never leaves you. Right? Because you're constantly running to store up, store up, 
a little bit more, a little bit more, if we have just a little bit more, then we could change the world. If we had just a little bit more, we'd be satisfied. If we have just a little bit more, we wouldn't have sleepless nights. And it's just, it never, ever happens. Jesus goes into a desert. If we get to the right city or the right place, it'll happen. If I'm around the right people, which that's a really wonderful thing to be around the right people. And even better to be the right person around the right people. If I could just get to the right place or the right person, the right city. You see, people knew that the villages and the cities, that's where the food was. You understand? This is... This is, where, this is where the supplies were. And yet, Jesus goes to a secluded place to be by himself. And upwards of 40,000 people follow him out to a desert place. And what happens? He sees them. He has compassion on them. Some of the Gospels say he teaches them many things. I'd have loved to have been, I, I wish there was more account of what he taught them. So I, one time I, my wife and I, Rachel, we got to go to uh, Mark Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And we just sat in that church and listened to Martin Luther King reels. They just have it on reel, him preaching to his flock. And in, in, in the whole two and a half hours that we were there, we never once heard, I have a dream. We never heard been to the mountaintop. All the sermons that I know him for, we never heard any of those sermons. You know what we heard? We heard a good shepherd just talking to the sheep, just being with them, just loving on them, having compassion. Hey, when you buy it, when you buy it, I, I wrote notes on it. When you, when you buy it, when you buy a car, don't go buy a brand new car. Go find something with a few miles on it. I just wonder, what, what did Jesus talk to them about? I wish we knew more. What did Jesus talk to them about? I love that. No mountaintop, none of that. None, all those, those are amazing. I could listen to them and they feel fresh and new every time I hear them. But those weren't the sermons on the real. Sermons on the real were, I care about you. Let me talk to you like a father would talk to the son. Like a father would talk to the daughter. That's the beauty and the compassion of Jesus. And he, and, he, and he had compassion on them. And he taught them many things. And he healed all of their diseases. Goodness. Everyone that was sick. Healed them. I love the playfulness of healing throughout history, don't you? I love the seriousness of it too. My wife was healed of cystic fibrosis. Like genetically, St. Luke's Hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin has her report, cystic fibrosis, somehow got completely changed. Her genome structure and healed her. My wife, my wife was fully barren. We were told we'd never be able to have children. Our first son, his name is Samuel. <laughs> Obviously. Right? Because at 1.30 in the morning in a prayer time at Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia, I was sleeping. I went to bed. They were still going. And I had to speak the next morning. And I wake up and Rachel's not there. It's 1.30 in the morning. I'm wondering, where is she? I go into the university chapel and there Rachel is just sitting on the front chair writing in her journal. She said, somebody came and prayed for me and I fell down to the ground. And as I was laying on the ground, I had my eyes closed and a, a, a cold hand came on my belly. 
just rested on my belly. And she said, and I looked up because she knew the rules among the prayer team was that no men were supposed to touch anybody. No women were, you were supposed to touch people, especially on their belly. And so she looked up and no one was there and she knew the presence of the holy was healing her. She knew it. And that, that cold hand turned fire hot. And we know to this day it sucked the infection right out of her. She, when Rachel and I... Well, I won't go into the details because it's kind of gross, but she doesn't even have to take Advil for her time of the month. It's crazy. He healed many diseases. How many of you know that, that, that arms, you want to talk about creativity, right? I love the creativity of God throughout history. St. Francis of Assisi would hold meetings. Troubadours would sing. They'd hold five o'clock mass services. And you know what they'd say? They'd say, I never understood this until I started studying it. They'd say, bring your donkey. Bring your cow that's sick. Bring them in. <laughs> Why? Because the creativity and the compassion of God knew that what we don't know today because we don't rely on the cow. We go to the grocery store. Do you know what I mean? And so they needed that cow. And if that cow could be brought back to life, it would feed. Imagine what happens when the cow gets healed at the, at the mass on Sunday. You did what? You brought the cow to the church? Yeah, brought her right to the church. Walked it right down the aisle. And Francis, we're going to pray over this cow. And the cow gets healed. And the man goes back. And the whole village is able to feed. That's the miraculous, creative, beautiful God. Compassionate God. I'll heal your cow. And he healed all their diseases. And they just kept coming, and they just kept coming. I love this. I was thinking about this one day. You know, maybe Jesus went to a desert place. And, and instead of running around looking for the promised land, he went to desert places and he turned desert places into promised lands. Or maybe he was such a son that maybe he just simply illuminated for us and revealed to us what it all, always was. Maybe it always was a promised land of sorts. Maybe people have been just in the wrong place looking for the wrong things that they could only get in that desert place. I don't know. And Jesus, he heals their diseases, and then it gets late. <laughs> now, this is the darndest thing. And the place is packed with people getting healed. How many, I believe that ears probably were open. I mean, I'm, I'm filling in the gaps, but certainly not out of context. Ears were probably opened, blind eyes probably saw. Who knows? But then it got to be late. And the disciples come to Jesus and they say this. Jesus, it's late. Now, I'm really tired. I'll be a little bit more awake tomorrow morning. But work with me here, guys, because that is ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus is healing everybody. People are getting healed of real things. And the disciples, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus 
it's getting late. <laughs> and the people are hungry. That's another thing that I think is funny, is the people didn't say, hey, Jesus, it's getting late and we're hungry. The disciples have to come to Jesus and tell Jesus what the people aren't going to tell Jesus. No, the people aren't complaining. The disciples. Jesus, it's getting late. Now, now, it's getting late. So I know you just, I know you just opened a blind person's eyes so they could see again, but they're going to get hungry. And they really need, this is the goodness. And when it was evening, the disciples, they came to him and they said, this, oh, and by the way, Jesus, this place, just in case you didn't know, it's desolate. That's good too. Jesus, this place is desolate and the people are getting hungry, so we need to bring them back. We need to send them back to the villages where the food is. They need the bread basket, Jesus. And Jesus says, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. So as creatives, I want to just take a few moments on this. The main function of a word is to communicate. So I want you to ask, is, is what I'm saying communicating? Ask yourself that. And, and what I mean by that is, is what I'm saying, is it creating community? Is it fostering communion? In the Bible... To speak and create are the same thing. So what are we creating by what we're saying? And what are we becoming by what we're receiving? What divine work is being done in me by the words I hear? And what divine work is being done around me by the words I speak. Words become flesh and dwell among us. Life is sacramental. What we receive, we become. If we receive love, we're going to love. If we receive grace, we're going to show grace. If we receive mercy, we're going to extend mercy. If we receive pardon, we'll pardon. When we receive, for 2,000 years, when we receive broken bread and poured out wine, we become what we're receiving. This is the reason, this is the reason that the Catholics call marriage a sacrament. You know why? Because they believe that when two people come together, they publicly make a declaration that they will participate in the ongoing creation of the other. That would change marriage. To realize that this marriage I'm, I'm in, right, this marriage that you're in, if it's broken down, it, it, it isn't that I create Rachel. God is the one that's creating Rachel, you see, and, and God is the one creating me. But I get to participate. I can be an impedance, 
a distraction of all that God is doing in Rachel and she in, in me. When we come together in union in marriage, it's called a sacrament because we're becoming what we're receiving. And over time, if the person, and this is a hard thing to say, but if the person isn't becoming what you think they ought to be becoming, there's a very good possibility it may be connected to what you are speaking and saying over them, over them, over, over and over and over and over and over again. We become what we receive. Jesus, before he ever fed the 5,000 or fed the 4,000 or walked on water or raised a dead person, he heard the voice of his father say, you are my beloved son. On you my favor rests. This is why there's two ladders in the Bible, I think. There probably are all sorts of other reasons why there's two ladders in the Bible, but this is definitely one of the reasons. It shows us one of the ladders is the ladder of Jesus and one of the ladders is the ladder of Jacob. And the Jacob story sadly starts, as amazing as Jacob is, the Jacob story sadly starts with a father who's so blind he can hardly make out the difference between his two sons. It's a crazy thing what, what that will do to you. He dresses himself up like his brother to receive a blessing from his father only to get away with it. That'll mess you up. And often as creatives, we don't even think that we'd ever do that. We'd never dress ourselves up like our brother to receive a blessing from our father. And the father can hardly make out the difference anyway. So there's the Jacob ladder. And then, I mean, what does that produce? It produces judgment and insecurity. Then there's the Jesus ladder, which that whole passage of John 1, 5, 1, it starts with Nathaniel making a judgment, pronouncing a creative word, Nothing good can come out of Nazareth. Nothing. And Jesus does not respond to that judgmental word with judgment. Jesus is leading us from being a judgmental culture to being a sacramental one. Jesus does not respond to judgment with judgment. Jesus responds to judgment with vision. Jesus responds to judgment with, I see you. I saw you under the fig tree. What did they do? What did young men do under the fig tree in all of their insecurity trying to climb that ladder? Like Merton says, a man can climb a ladder all of his life only to reach the top and find its, its, its face in the wrong wall. Ladders are important. And, Je and Jesus is saying, hey, I started my journey off listening to the voice of my father say, you are my beloved son, and what you receive, you become. How about you, Nathaniel? What did they do under those, those fig trees? They dreamed about their future. You saw me? Judgment ends just by saying, I, I saw you under the fig tree. Isn't that interesting? This is, this is our world. We want to judge. We want to judge. We want to judge. And Jesus calls us to be an alternative culture of people who see, Amen. who receive from their father, and what they receive, they become. A father who sees right where you are. A father who knows you by your name. And so, of course, Jesus walks into a desert place and it becomes a promised land because Jesus is not living according to judgment, according to just his eyes, but he's seeing, right? Sacramentally, declaring. And why is that important? Because of this, this little part here. Hey, Jesus, we only have five loaves and two fish. We just don't have enough. And look what Jesus does. 
he says, almost, I get the sense that he's almost frustrated. And he says, listen, all right, bring to me what you say is not enough. It's not enough. Bring to me what you say isn't enough. And Jesus takes what they say is not enough. And this is the powerful part of it. Jesus doesn't make it enough according to our judgmental standards. Jesus just says, well, it's coming from my Father, so it must be enough. It's already enough. And Jesus takes what they've already declared as not enough and he raises it up to his father and he blesses it. This is is the beauty of sacrament. He could only have blessed it the way his father blessed him. So what he's received, he becomes. What does he do? He begins to bless it. Before you even feed these people, you're already enough. This is what he's saying. Because that's what we become when we receive those kind of words. Why are they important? Because they transform and change us. And Jesus takes what they have already declared is not enough and he lifts us up. This this is one of the things I love about it. The Bible says, and Jesus thanks his father for it. Man, thank you. And then he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives it to his disciples. And the Bible doesn't indicate that his disciples, that it turns into this large smorgasbord that everybody just comes and devours. That's not what it says at all. That's not the beauty of it. He just, they just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating, and everybody is satisfied, and they have leftovers. Because the main function of a word is to create. What we receive, we become. God wants to turn creatives. We have a tendency to be insecure. Running around looking for a place, right? I love it. Wendell Berry says about place, he, he's got this, there's a documentary because he hates, uh, he, he only types with a typewriter still in his, in his 90s. And so he doesn't use computers, he doesn't use technology, he would probably, you know, get on my case for having a computer. And, and so they did this documentary and he finally allowed someone in to show his life. It's on Netflix. You can watch it. And it's called Look and See. And it's powerful because, because they show this place where he, 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 was, a, he was a Stanford uh, grad. He was a, a scholar in, in literature. He went to the University of Kentucky. Was an amazing scholar there. Teacher. And then all of a sudden, he just made the decision, you know what? Man, I meet all these farmers, and they're smarter than most of these people I'm, I'm with in the universities. This is what he says in the documentary. So he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to farm my father's land. And I'm going to care for that land, and I'm going to write from this place. This is a guy that has 66 or 67 books that have been put into print, millions upon millions upon millions. He's changed the agricultural system in America. I mean, he was the one, he was the one that basically protested that, that, that basically in the early part of the 1900s, two-thirds of the United States population were farmers. And by the time 1990 hit, because in the middle we decided that we were going to eradicate farming, because it, it depended on mercy gifts like sunshine and rain, and we didn't want to depend on God. We could just make our food with machinery. And then they eradicated the farming population, and by 1990, 
less than 2% of the United States population were farmers and less than 1% of that 2% lived on the land that they farmed and ate the produce from that land. Which, which means what to you? What it means to me is, what, would you eat the food from a farmer who, does, who wouldn't eat it himself? And he says one day in the future, he prophesies in the 90s, one day in the future, people will begin to protest. The consumers will begin to protest because they're going to begin to realize that their need for certainty is poisoning them. So when I wrote on Table Full of Strangers, Volume 2, we started Table Full of Strangers, Volume 1, with the song, Seek First Your Kingdom, Seek First. But I wanted to take that concept in Volume 2 deeper. And so I started with, and there was a time not long ago when the sun did shine and the sower sowed and the rain did rain and the crops did grow. It was a time before machinery, a time before certainty, a time before we bought the lie, a time before the farmer died when we had trusting hearts. And human soul, it was a time not very long ago. Why? Why does it matter? Because it's not just about agriculture. The agricultural prophet Jesus, the farmer prophet Jesus, the farmer prophet carpenter Jesus, he does, we're depending on machinery and he's saying, why don't you depend on the sunshine and the rain anymore? Because they're mercy gifts. Because mercy gifts are unpredictable. So so you know what we'd rather do in church instead instead of wait for the sun to rise? Right? If you're going to wait for a sun to rise, what do you have to do? You have to stare at the darkness. That's uncomfortable to stare at darkness. So what do we do? We, We create these, you know what I mean? It's a... I love this sermon, by the way. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You know what I mean? That's an amazing sermon, right? But if, but if done too often in your worship, it will cheapen your worship. Because it's important to just be left in the darkness. Because if you're never left in the darkness, resurrection will have no power to you anymore. Hey, don't worry. Don't worry. It's Friday or Sunday. You know, hey, don't. No, no, no. no. And that's an amazing sermon, by the way. But, but it's just, it's just, the point is, you got to sometimes just be left in the darkness and learn to wait and stare. Right? Just stare in the darkness until you see the light. And then that becomes merciful to you. Well, anyway, he says, so he goes and he puts in a 42 paned or 44 paned window in this old shed. And you get to see it in the film. And then he says, and I just taught my children, just keep looking, keep seeing. And so he's going to look for the next 60 some odd years. He's going to look as a creative artist. Think about this creatives. He's going to look at the same scenery. And he's just going to look a little bit further and see what's there. What have I missed? And then he's just going to begin to do what? To write from what he's seeing. This is what he says in the middle of the film as they're showing that 44 pane or 42 pane window coming in. He says, in a sense, what I have done all my life, this is the 91-year-old speaking, is hold up an artifact that you can, so to speak, see through against the world. The length of vision from that place is a limitation in me, not in the place. So think about Jesus walking in, right, to the desert, desolate place that he is actually a promised land, but we all keep telling him it's desolate. We all keep telling him that there isn't enough, and he says, well, darn it, bring me what you say isn't enough, and then he lifts it up to his father and says, thank you. And what about the creativity of your own life? Is it where you are? This is what he says. This is the man who, I mean, I hate to even have to say this, that he sold millions of copies because it feeds into the machinery. But how did he keep writing? He kept going back to that typewriter and that same window and that same vision. And he says, there's no limitation here. If there's any limitation, that limitation's in me. 
How about the same marriage? How about the same church, the same community, the same culture, the same place? We're bouncing around so often. When are we going to just put in the window and start looking? You know what they're doing in marriages to heal marriages right now? Because we need them, especially among young people. I, I, I talk to people all the time that the marriages are dying. One of my friends, they went and got help. Thank God. Go, we need to get help. All of us, me, everybody, we need help. We need to cry out to Jesus and cry out for help. But you know what they're doing? It's this new, this new thing. A friend of mine went, and he's a man's man. And when I say that only joking, but it's kind of true. He's a man's man, and he t- he's telling me the story. He says, I went into this place, and then it, about... 10 minutes into the, or no, in two sessions in, 10 minutes into the third session, that's what it was, they said, now we're going to do something that's going to make you all feel uncomfortable. And there's older people there, there's younger people there, they're a younger couple, right? What we're going to do is, you're all going to stand up and you're going to, married couples, you're going to look at each other. And then they just leave them there in silence. No music. Just gaze in a little further. Come on. Then they're just silent for another two, three minutes. And he says it almost took, you know, six, seven minutes of just gazing at her, Jason. And all of a sudden her eyes begin to fill with tears and my eyes begin to fill with tears. And I started seeing things. Now you're going to start to see things. Your eyes are all going to, all of a sudden your eyes are going to open. The blind are going to see. You're going to start seeing things you never saw before. Just keep looking. They get 10 minutes in, 15 minutes in, 20 minutes in. He says, you get to a certain point and you don't want it to end. No technology, no music, no sad music. Just two people looking at each other. I love what he says here. In a sense, what I've done all my life is hold up an artifact that you can, so to speak, see through against the world. The length of vision from that place is a limitation in me, not in the place. Listen to this. You, listen to this promise over you, where you are, in your marriage, in your life, in your family. Just raise your hands to heaven and receive this. In your life, in your family, where you are, at your home. This is what he declares. You can see all the way to the stars from almost any place you are. Just receive that. I can see all the way to the stars from almost any place I am. To live in a place and have your vision confined by it would be a mistake. Right? So to live in a place that's racist, right? And to allow your vision to be blinded, impeded, right? By racism would be a mistake. He's not saying just live wherever and allow all the bondage of that place to exist in your life. He's saying, no, he's saying, he's saying to live in a place and have your vision confined by it would be a mistake. But to live up, to live in a place and try to understand it as a standpoint from which to see and then to see from there as far as you can. That's a proper challenge. So Jesus walks into a desert place and he turns it into a promised land and 40,000 people are fed because he just receives what's been given. That's the, that's the darndest thing about being worshipers and artists and creatives is we keep thinking. If we keep adding to it, if we extract all the weakness, if we fill it with right? Preservatives. It will satisfy. But how many of you know it doesn't? 
And weirdly, what God often will do to so many is lower me down. <laughs> oh, Jesus, lower me down to be with you. Because the deaf and the blind and the poor in spirit, they're not looking at their watches. They're here with you. We're all desperately trying to be with you. <laughs> that took me longer than I thought to get there, but you understand, right? I took a bunch of worship artists to go see. Uh, in October, I'll take a bunch again to, to, to go up to the Jesuit retreat house in particular, this one man named Father Larry Gillick, he's a blind Jesuit priest. Unbelievable. There are many places, the prayer house in Kansas City, Bethel, there's lots of places. This, this man is, whole, like when you leave his presence, just being around him, you just want to get closer to Jesus. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, there's a lot of other things you can get into. But you know that any of these places that we all go and attend and everything, there's those special people that you're like, I just want to get closer to Jesus. Those are the kind of people you want to hang with. And so I do the same. I don't just bring my friends to anything. I bring them, oh, man, Father Gillick's leading this retreat. Let's get there. And we do everything we can and we get there. I'll never forget the first time. I had my buddy Pat Barrett who wrote that Bill My Life was there and so, uh, like 15 other artists and we're all there and I've told these guys all about this guy but they're thinking in terms of like Atlanta. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you give us like churches, like lights and like, you know, and we get there and he's blind, and he's in a new retreat center, and he, but he's going to find his way up to, you know, the front. And this is Father Larry Gillick. Like, one time I was up there running. I was going for a jog, and, and, and he went jogging by me. <laughs> and, I, and I found out later that when he was in his 40s, he had to break off the shame of being blind, and he had gotten himself overweight, and he was teaching poetry class, and all the kids hate poetry, he said. And I was depressed, and there I am. And I woke up and I, from a dream, and in this dream, God was speaking to me and said, Larry, why don't you run? You used to love running when you were a kid. He became blind when he was eight from a fall. And before that time, he loved to run, and he saw himself in this dream running. So he said, so I'm 40 years old, I'm teaching poetry, and I decided I'm, gonna, I'm just going to walk into that poetry class because almost all those fresh, it was freshman poetry too. All those, all those boys were nearly failing, and they all needed extra credit. So I said, does anybody in here need extra credit, and does anybody in here that needs extra credit know how to run marathons? And one of the kids said, I need extra credit, I know how to run marathons. He said, okay, meet me at 6 a.m. at the at the men's locker room at the school, and they, they met up, and he tethers himself. Talk about breaking off shame. He tethers himself to this kid, and he's run between one and five marathons per year, and he's 78 years old since, tying himself. So I said, well, how did you run by me? He said, oh, I ran by you. I'm so sorry I didn't say hi. I said, well, I just said, no, that's okay. I just said, how did you run by me? He said, well, if it's a straight, if it's a straight way, I've gotten good. I've gotten good enough that I can do it myself, all by myself. So he's walking up. This is his moment to come up. Father Larry Gillick is going to lead our retreat. And <laughs> you see, and some people would say in this moment, Oh, but wouldn't it be great if Father Larry Gillick could see? And all I have to say to that is the more I'm around Father Larry Gillick, I start to realize that he's the one that can see and I'm the one that's blind. And that's just the mystery of it. 
So there he is, and he's, he's walking up, and he wants to make his way up, and all of my buddies are here, and he, he runs into the wall. That's his entrance. First talk. I mean, I've talked about this guy like he is Bono from U2. <laughs> if that even... <laughs> I mean, and he walks up... He walks up to give his first talk and he runs into the wall. And then as he's finding his way down the wall to try to find his seat, he hits his head on the light. And now all of us younger guys are thinking, is it dishonoring if we get up and help him? Should we help him? Should we let him be? We should just probably let him be. So we just sit in silence and just let him find his way to his seat and he sits down and he turns on his lapel mic and he, the first words out of his mouth are, things take as long as they take. That's how we're going to start the retreat. I look over at all my friends and tears are fall, coming down their faces and, and Pat looks over at me and he says, we're screwed. <laughs> it's a terrible word, I understand, but probably not meant for us. But we all like we all start giggling and crying together because we know, oh man, we're set up. This guy's gonna take us for a ride. <laughs> but at the end of uh, my last retreat with him, I went in and I said. Father Gillick, I said, why do I love where I am? Why do I love where I am? I love where I am. I've lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What, where, I tell people I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and they say, why do you live there? It's not like saying you're from Santa Maria. You know what I mean? That's kind of cheating. But you live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's like, ooh, it's, you know, but I love it. And we've raised our family there. We just love it. And we have our my father-in-law takes each one of our kids on a Bible study every single week of the summer. My father-in-law takes an entire Bible and decides who is it going to be this year and doesn't tell any of us. And then at Christmas the following year, somebody, one of the, either the father and the son or the mother and the daughter, get the Bible that he's prayed through the entire thing and written in every margin praying for those kids, leaving that kind of legacy. That's why I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I said to him, I said, is it weird? Am I, am I missing out on something? Father Gilly? He says, well, I'm the la last person you should ask that. I mean, I grew up in South Milwaukee. And now I live in Nebraska. And there's absolutely nothing in Nebraska. But I love it. He said, but what I've learned is when we love who we are, we will always love where we are. One last thing. I know it's late. Among creatives, I think we live in a time where we're being sort of led into this. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it. I don't want to make a dualism here and make it wrong. But there's a, there's a lot of temptation that would, it's possible that you could almost feel like what you do is important because you're known. Or because people see what it is that you're doing, Right? It's interesting that when Jesus talks about those secret things, you know, maybe it was just that judgmental kind of thing that I grew up with, which is actually was quite good for me in some ways. But sometimes I wish my son had a little bit of that. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, you could go to hell for that. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, but they've lived in so much grace sometimes. I'm kind of kidding, but it's like I, I got saved like 40 times before I was 10. You know what I mean? But so grace was a wonderful thing, you know, for me. Uh, it's a little bit like the light without the darkness, right?
So I don't want to make a, a dualism here and say that it's bad to be known. But I think sometimes we're, we're qualifying who we are and our value based on commodifiable both things that if, 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 if you're on the shelf and your people are buying you, that's what makes you valuable. Somehow I feel like I kind of squeaked through. I don't know how I squeaked through that. But I was always able to sort of just inadvertently, you know, go into the darkness and find my way back to the light and learn and grow. You know the, the, this of the journey of creativity, right? But we're scared to go, we're scared to do that. We're scared to go into the places where we're actually going to grow and learn and bring something new again, right? And sometimes you get to the place where you actually feel known and you actually feel like you finally understand yourself, especially People like me who are very circular thinkers. Because in your developmental stage of being a circular thinker, you will lose yourself like at 2 o'clock and never get back. <laughs> and the linear thinker development is just either a short line or a long line. The reward of the linear thinker is understanding. The reward of the circular thinker, if you'll let it develop, that's wonder. It's mystery. But often what I worry about with these circulars is we're losing the circulars because we've become so pop-driven. Everything has got to be popular in order to be valuable. you got to flip and go listen to country music to get lament. Because... <laughs> Because everybody that's leading worship these days is an Enneagram 7. It's like, avoid pain at all costs. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. That's enough darkness. Oh, God. No, 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 no. I... And my son, I know this because my son Sam is a 7, and he's always like, he's, and you're not supposed to like label people, but it's like, he, he always is saying, he's always saying to me, Dad, if you'd stop speaking of metaphors, I totally understand what you're talking about. You know what I mean? So we're different. We're different. So we don't want to, we don't make this legalistic, but I feel like there's too much depression and oppression over all these smiley faces. Why is the suicide rising? I actually found out the other day, to my horror, because authenticity is so important to me. Even if I'm authentically wrong. Somebody told, my daughter told me three or four weeks ago, you know, Dad, that people can follow you and mute you? I said, oh, my God. What a horrible, horrible we're horrible. I mean, not to mention how much we do that to Jesus. But I just thought, wow, that's horrible. We follow somebody. It's like, hey, buddy. And then we wonder, how can so many be people be seeing your smiley face and yet you feel so alone. This is our world. And I have so many artistic friends that just flip and have to get off of all media because it, it brings them so into depression because they just don't feel like what they're creating has any value or worth. And you listen to it and you're like, this is some of the most beautiful writing. I mean, even some of my friends that, you know, we write pop tunes and you do all that. Stuff, and then you sit around and listen to some of this music and everybody knows, right? I mean, everybody knows this is some of the great writing that will never be known, but it's some of the best. It's like my buddy Al Sergal told me when he, 
He's a jazz musician. And, I, and when he started traveling with me 16, 17 years ago, I said, well, hey, man, I'm not in this to be popular or famous and make a lot of money. So if you want to make a lot of money, you shouldn't probably be following me because I don't know if I'm going that direction. And that was kind of the conversations I was having at the time. Because the faith record had come out and I was like, I'm not there anymore. We were doing Jacob's Dream and Dying Star and all that stuff. I mean, Dying Star right after faith. I mean, it was like a weird for me. But it was like my father-in-law just kept saying, just keep praying, keep seeking God, and just let him keep leading you. And I remember he said, well, Jay, you know how you make a lot of money at jazz music? You know how you make $2 million playing jazz music? I said, how? He said, you start with $1 million. I mean, you say, no, how do you make $1 million? I ruined that. You start with $2 million. That's funny. <laughs> I, I just want to push up against this, and then I'm going to pray over you. But being known... John 1, I love this. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. Well, you think about that as creatives. The creator of the, he was in the world, and the whole world was made, was created through him. And yet the world didn't even know him. It's not to say that it's wrong to be known. You understand, right? I just want to push up against that a little bit. We've made it an idol. And it's holding us back from our joy, from what we were created for, from who we were created to be, and the songs that we need to be expressing, that we're afraid to express because, oh, those songs. I mean, <laughs> who wants to write? Seventy-some-odd percent of the psalms are lament. I mean, I don't like lament songs either. I don't, maybe, maybe we don't need 70%. But it's like, can you, what would we even do? Because I preach this and then I ask myself when I go to Sunday service with my family, would I want them to sing lament this morning? It's realizing that we were created to lead people, to grow people. You know, I'm, I'm noticing that Rachel's trying to get me back in, you know, shape as we go to the gym and all that stuff. And it's like the gym is the one place. There's so many universities. Sam's going to university. There's such high standards, right? He's going to go to med school. High standards to get in. Right? Everything's high standards. You go to work out. And a lot of times because of my schedule, I'm able to go with Rachel and it's just all women in the class. And that, I hate those classes because then they just totally pick on me. <laughs> Let's make fun of the little overweight guy that's back there trying to be with his wife and work out. And then it's like, they come after you. Jason! Oh, man. <laughs> Rachel started taking me to this spin class a couple weeks ago, and we started doing this spin class, but the spin class isn't one of those spin classes where you can sort of like turn it way down and like just spin your legs when you get tired. It's one of those spin classes where the bikes are so expensive that they light up the color that you're riding at, the intensity. So as you're riding, it's lighting up. So then the person's like, I'm like, you've got to be flipping kidding me. And so, so it's like, so I'm in there for the first time, and she's like, you're in green! She's screaming at me, Jason, red, red, come on, are you here to work out or what? <laughs> Yelling at me. I haven't been back. I need to go back. But I told Rachel, I'm like, that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Why would she do that to me? I'm only saying that because it's almost like church is the one place that we come to that we don't expect to be challenged, to grow, to be pushed beyond our, hey! Yeah. Do you remember, I remember the old days, you know, of the calls and Lou Engle would just be up there. He was like the Hulk Hogan of Christians. <laughs> it was just like, you eat your vitamins! You know what I mean? That's what it felt like. And we're all about, this generation, my generation, we just immediately went, what? This is amazing. And you just, 
You need to pray harder. Go further, deeper, stronger. And I feel like church is the one place where just as worshipers, as artists, don't be afraid to be that person, that instructor that doesn't put up with the slacker. No, no, no. We need to be full of compassion and loving. You, you understand? I, we don't, I don't need to make it so hard. I'm just saying, but we need to hear this as creatives. Don't, why are you putting up with a slacker? Like, wh- why, why is it just assumed that nobody prays and reads their Bible? So just kind of keep it cheap. Keep it happy. <laughs> Woohoo! Let's just keep telling God again for the 90 billionth time what we're going to do for him. And the amazing thing about God is he keeps believing us like a little kid whose father has not taken him to the game forever. He keeps coming back every Sunday, after Sunday, after Sunday, and we keep telling him all the things we're going to do for him, and somehow God keeps believing us. Just pushing into that a little bit. He was in the world... The world was made through him, and the world did not know him. This is a quote that I'm sure you guys have heard. But I want to just say it one last time. Henry Nouwen, who, by the way, I think the power of his life was the weakness of his life. When you read accounts of his life, he was not a perfect individual with a perfect life and a perfect prayer life and... He was full of insecurity, and I think that's why the vulnerability of his life helps so many people. His walk with Jesus helps and heals so many people. He says this, he goes, We know intuitively that everything that moves us by its delicacy, its vulnerability, and pristine beauty can stand only very little public exposure. The mass media, which I think is interesting because when he was speaking here in the 70s when he wrote this, there was no mass media really within church that he would have been speaking from that context. So even more so for us, where mass media has become a real part of church too. The mass media which magnify creativity and intimacy are proof of that. What is precious and sacred in hiddenness often becomes cheap and even vulgar when exposed to the public at large by the mass media. Publicity standardizes, hardens, and those of you that are songwriters and artists, I want you to hear this, and not infrequently suffocates what it exposes. Many great minds and spirits have lost their creative force through too early or too rapid exposure to the public. We know it, we sense it, but we easily forget it because our world persists in proclaiming the big lie that to be unknown means to be unloved. So Jesus, and I know I went long, but just raise your hands to heaven. And Jesus walks in to your life, to your home, to your marriage, to your hopes and dreams for your children and your children's children, to our church. Lower me down, Jesus. I want to be with you. Because I know you're, you're in that 
Jesus, I know you're in that rusty bucket. I know, Jesus, that your, your eyes are not just on what's popular and your eyes aren't on what's just bad. Your eyes are fixed on all of the goodness that we overlook. And even so much goodness in our own lives... that's often rendered almost helpless and powerless because we, we put so much on it. God set us free from the insecurity. Set us free from the spirit that says, it's not enough, I need to keep adding. We just break off that spirit of insecurity. And we just declare over you, you are my son, you are my daughter, on you my favor rests. It's like that frequency, that radio frequency, right? It's like, it's like we, we just tuning in to the right frequency. There's all these other frequencies, but God, tune us into your frequency. What is it that you're saying over us? What do you say over the place where we live? The place where we work, the marriages that we're in, the church that we're in. The community. God, open our eyes. We want to see. Take away the judgment and bring that gift of sacrament, Lord. And we ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I love that um, chorus that I want to learn it. Is it lower? Sing that out. Can we sing that? Oh, lower me down. Can you sing it again? Lower me down. Lower me down. Sing that, just sing it a couple more times. Lower me down. Oh, Jesus. Lower me down. I want to be with you. Sing it out. Lower me down. Oh, Jesus. Lower me down. I want to be with you. I just thank you. I thank you, God, for uh, Jason Upton. Thank you for the heart of the Father that was released tonight. And I just bless him. Can we just stretch our hands to Jason, Lord? We just ask that you'd bless him. I just ask that you'd bless him, that you would refresh him. And we thank you for the rich words that he spoke tonight, your heart to us. And I thank you for him. I thank you for his family. Just bless him, strengthen him, 
we ask for more amazing songs to keep our heart in the right spot. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So we have, um, we wanted to, uh, can we show the video? Because we have a surprise for you. July 2020, we want you to get this on your calendars. Um, this will be Create 2020. It is July 18th. That's when our worship advance starts. Um, and our worship conference is the 23rd to the 25th of July 2020. And can we show that video for our special guest. Yo guys, what's up? Yo guys, what's up? It's Rick Pino here. I'm so pumped to be joining you next year at Create 2020. The presence of God is going viral all over the earth right now. And God is looking for someone to connect the yes of their life to the worth and the beauty and the majesty of who he is. So I know you guys are probably gonna have a good time this year, but next year I'm coming. You better come join us. I can't wait to see you guys there. Hey, Graham. Oh, hi, Rachel. How are you doing? Uh, what time is it tomorrow? 10 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, Jason Upton again. Uh, uh, my worship leader, Pastor Joe Moss, will be leading us in worship. It's going to be a great time. God bless you, and we will see you tomorrow.